Today's build show, one of my favorite topics, insulation. Now here at my studio, I've got some insulation in between the studs. And when I, when I say insulation, that's what most people think of is that inside insulation. But this build show is about outsulation, exterior insulation. This is some rigid insulation that's gonna go on the outside of the house. This is manufactured by Halo, they call it Xterra. And this is gonna go on the outside of the house to insulate, that's why I like to call it outsulation. Now my buddy Joe Stebrick has a great analogy about exterior versus inside insulation. And Joe says, you know, if you were cold, you're going out, you're naked, you walk outside, how would you warm your body? Would you stuff that insulation? Would you put that parka in between your ribs and haphazardly insulate this way? I'm not sure that you would. If you had a nice parka like this and it's cold out, of course, you're gonna insulate the entire outside of your body. You're gonna put that outsulation on. Ah, oh, much better. So now when I go outside, I zip up my jacket, I'm nice and warm. I've got a continuous blanket of insulation on the outside of my body. Today's build show, we're gonna get into three reasons why you want outsulation, three reasons how you're gonna install that outsulation, and how much outside insulation you need. Today's video is sponsored by Halo. Let's get going. Okay, y'all, first, when we talk about outsulation, let's talk about why we need it. Uh, if you're watching this and you're in North America, by the way, you should double check which climate zone you're on because one of the big reasons why you're gonna wanna consider outsulation is because you might be forced to. <laughs> the 2021 energy codes, which are being adopted all over the US now, have a big change in the codes. And you're gonna notice on this code map right here, that anybody who's in climate zone four or above has to use exterior insulation. Now, if you're in climate zone three, you can still get away with a two by six frame wall with a standard uh, bat uh, product on the inside without going to insulation by code. And if you're in climate zone one or two, you can still do a two by four framed wall. But anything from four and above, you're gonna have to use continuous insulation. Now, it's interesting to see on here that in climate zone four, you could actually go up to an R30 wall. I've actually never seen an R30 interior bat before, but they probably do make it. But if you're framing your house with two by six, climate zone four, you need R20 inside the cavity, and you're gonna need at least R5 out -salation. Or if you're using a two by four framed wall, you're gonna need R10 on the outside. That CI stands for continuous uh, insulation. Now go up to those higher zones, you know, more uh, Northern America and Southern Canada. That's climate zone six, let's say. Look at this, now we're getting into R10 uh, on, or pardon me, now we're getting into R20 showing up on the code. So actually climate zone six, you could get away with not doing any insulation and doing all outsulation. R20 on the outside would qualify as a code uh, approved house. Get up to that seven and eight zone and you've got uh, five and 10. So in other words, codes are changing and you're gonna have to more than likely start doing inside insulation before long. Now, that code isn't changing today. Let's, uh, let's, let's be honest here. This is not a, the sky is falling. Uh, here's a, a slide that Halo gave me, projected adoption of 2024, uh, in 2024 of the 21 IRC. Look at your state on here. Some states don't require any uh, codes currently, but that doesn't mean that you wouldn't necessarily have to follow this code. For instance, Texas on this map is still under the 2018 uh, codes, but guess what? I'm in the city of Austin that adopts its own codes that are above that. So even though the state is on the 2018 codes, I have a higher mandate. And in fact, I have an exterior insulation mandate all the way down here in Texas. The same is true in Colorado. I was just there this past week. Even though it's showing the state hasn't adopted a code, local jurisdictions have, and a lot of jurisdictions have very, very restrictive codes. So my point is, if you're not currently required to use exterior insulation, that's coming soon to a town near you. Okay, reason number two for why exterior insulation, risk mitigation for both you as the builder and for your clients. Let's talk about condensation. This is a, this is a real and true risk uh, in especially the Northern climates. Here's a, here's a good kind of real world example. Here's some images of a uh, window on the outside of a building. That's where windows go, right? 
uh, that has some condensation forming on the window. We've all seen this, whether you're in Texas, I've seen it, or you're in Minnesota, everyone's seen this at some point in their life. And what's happening here? This is an aluminum uh, window, non-thermally broken. The aluminum's cold from the outside. That cold is transferring in. It has a thermal bridge. The aluminum is bringing the cold in. And then there's a surface on that aluminum that's cold enough that condensation is forming. Uh, if it gets cold enough, that can form in other places too. This actually happened this past winter. I grabbed this from Reddit. Check out the outside temperature in Chicago. I want to say that it was minus 11 Chicago when this was taken and somebody posted it on Reddit. Look at the crazy frost on the inside of the wall. Also interesting to see where it's happening. It's happening on the corner. Most likely this was a three stud corner, no insulation on that corner. Uh, the cold was migrating through probably a two by four wall, let's say, that was just R4 because of the studs only. And now you've got frost happening on the inside of the house. You've got condensation that was cold enough to actually become frost. So that, that could have been condensation, uh, but instead it even got colder and it turned into frost. The problem with that is when it warms up, it's going to melt. And now we're going to have potentially sheetrock damage. If this happens over time in this spot, it could cause uh, fungal growth. It even could cause deterioration on the sheathing. Here's an example, even from uh, a Texas climate, which is not very cold. This is this past December when uh, during the day when I took the screenshot, it was 28 degrees. The overnight low was 13. Uh, pretty cold for us Texans. I know you northern people are, uh, are laughing at us here, uh, but that's cold for us. The inside of my house, though, I took a quick screenshot here. 37% relative humidity inside my house that day in 72 uh, degrees. So a pretty warm house, but really relatively low humidity, right? I always think of uh, 40 is about as low as my dehumidifier is going to get my humidity, and that's about as low as I want to be in my house. But if we were to type those numbers into a psychrometric chart, uh, by the way, here's a free one on, um, on the App Store, the Santa Fe psychrometric chart. You know what, actually, let's go to the live chart. It might be kind of fun to actually do this live for you. So let's see, the temperature was 72 inside my house. The relative humidity was 37%. That means the dew point inside my house was 44 degrees. So any surface that's 44 degrees or colder is going to have condensation on it. That could be on, the, on my ice cold glass. If I've got a glass of water in my house, even in the winter when it's dry out, uh, that glass is gonna have condensation in my house because that glass is gonna keep the water at 32 degrees. The dew point is lower than 44, which means I'm gonna see condensation. I also saw some condensation on some of my double pane windows uh, on this particular day. Now what happens though if my humidity is actually raised in my house? Let's say uh, I don't use my bath fans. Uh, I have multiple children in the house. Uh, I have uh, six dogs. My humidity inside the house goes up a little bit. Check what happens to my dew point now. Now the dew point of my house, if I was 57% relative humidity at 72 on the thermostat, now my dew point's 56. Now let's translate back, the, back to our walls. The backside of my sheathing, let's behind that insulation, my inside insulation, let's say, if that sheathing's cold, I could easily have a surface that's 56 degrees. I could e easily have a surface that's 40 degrees. What was the dew point when it was uh, 37? Uh, 44 degrees. If air were to leak into that cavity or leak out of that cavity, let's say, from my humid house to the outside, it's very likely there could be a surface that could be 44 degrees. So by adding exterior insulation to your house, what are you gonna do? You're gonna warm up that sheathing on the outside of your house which means that if you do have any air leakage inside or out, now there's not a cold surface to find a condensation. That's gonna reduce the chance of fungal growth. That's gonna make sure that your walls stay dry on the inside. A host of good things happen when you've got that sheathing warm and your wall cavity doesn't have those cold surfaces inside of it. Okay, the third reason for why exterior insulation, future proofing. Here's a great example. My buddy Larry Clay, who's a builder up in Canada, he's in the Vancouver area. Vancouver, a couple of years ago, was uh, given this thing from the government called the step codes, where they said, by 2030, we're going to ratchet down the code so that you have to have a greater amount of insulation on the outside of your building, and you have to have a more airtight envelope. And so Larry that I met with, this is uh, a guy I met in 2019, said to me, hey, Matt, you know what I'm doing now, 10 years ahead of this code, as I'm telling my clients, hey, if you want to meet 2030 codes, 
here's a package, here's how much it costs, I can add this much exterior insulation, I can go to this higher package on my windows and my air tightness, and guess what, he found that like 95% of his clients were like, absolutely, I would definitely pay that to be future-proofed. So that now he goes to his clients and says, hey, I'm gonna build you this house in 2023, but guess what, it'll meet codes even in 2030 when the codes ratchet down to this really low level. That's a big deal for homeowners. They would love to be able to think, oh gosh, if, if I had to sell this and move for my job to Chicago in five years, I know that I could resell this house as a new house because it would be meeting current codes. That's a really big deal. The other thing about future proofing is I think that there's so much change happening in the world. There's so much weird weather happening that this is gonna future proof you for that as well. Think about what happened in Texas when we had that crazy ice storm in 20, what was this, 2021. Here's a couple images from my house uh, and check out what uh, we were doing on the streets <laughs> because we're not used to having snowfall in Texas. But what else happens when it gets really cold outside in Texas? Builders weren't used to building with exterior insulation and I got this video from a buddy. This is a multi-million dollar house in a really expensive part of town. It was really cold for a couple of days and in fact we lost power in a few uh, places of town for a couple of days. Check out what was happening in here. I mean, this is a really ugly video to get as a builder. Think about, think about getting that video from your client and how much your heart would sink. Now that what we're looking at there was probably a burst pipe uh, in an exterior wall or an exterior ceiling. And those people have, I don't know, half million dollars for the cleanup or more. They're probably gonna be out of their house for six months. They may have some uh, mold remediation. Who knows what, this is gonna be ugly. A lot of this can be prevented by future proofing and thinking about this ahead of time, doing that exterior insulation. How much exterior insulation do we need though? Let's switch gears for a minute before we get into the how. If you look at this chart right here, let's look at the numbers on there. Uh, even in climate zone one, two, and three, there's an exterior number right there, which is R10. And then climate zone three, it gets into, okay, we could still build a uh, two by four framed wall and do R5. Well, guess what? Halo Xterra, one inch, uh, is R5. Actually, that's not entirely true. One and one sixteenth inch is R5, but since we're all friends here, let's just call it R5, right? This one inch of Halo Xterra on the outside of my building in climate zone three, even if I have a two by four wall, is gonna warm up significantly that sheathing. And let's, let's follow that R5 uh, in the code and look, in the next zone up, I can also do R5. So an inch would also work in climate zone four. We get into climate zone five, we can also still do that in meet code. Uh, climate zone six and climate zone seven, we can still meet code. However, now you're seeing uh, the introduction of R10 in there as well, and even R20. The zero plus 20 means you could actually omit your inside insulation, build the house perfect wall style, by the way, check out my videos on Perfect Wall. Uh, I built several houses with no interior insulation and only exterior outsulation. Now you could even in a very, very northern climate uh, get away with, not get away with, have a very well-built house with no inside insulation and R20 on the outside. It goes back to that jacket that I was wearing earlier, putting that big puffy jacket on the house so you're not as worried about stuffing that insulation. Now I did both at my house, don't get me wrong, and you could absolutely do that as well. But when we're thinking about future proofing, I'm gonna tell you that just about anywhere in North America, one inch is a great start, two inches is even better. And that's actually what I did at my house here in Texas was two inches of exterior insulation. Now let's get into the how. This is an important part of the video. We're switching gears here a little bit. And I'm gonna give you three ways to do it. I'm gonna give you the best way I'm gonna give you a better way and I'm gonna give you a good way. I'm gonna kind of do it in reverse order the way most people think about it. The best way to do it in my mind is to put your WRB on the house on top of the sheathing first so that you've got an airtight and a watertight house and then we're gonna put that exterior insulation on. Now I got a, I got a visual on that for you and, then, and this is a little bit backwards. Normally when you think about your ski jacket or your raincoat, you're gonna put your puffy jacket on first and then you're gonna put your raincoat on. But I'm gonna tell you, when it comes to the details on the house, actually, this way is a little better. Let's put our raincoat on first. Let's make sure the house is both water and airtight. Let's put that on. And then let's grab our puffy jacket and put our puffer jacket on the outside. This, I think, is a great way to go 
with exterior insulation. It makes all the details easy. It means we can install our windows easier. It looks a little dorky in a video, but trust me, when you build your house, this is a great way to go. Okay, the next way to do it is actually to solid sheet the house and then use the foam, the Halo Xterra, as your WRB. Believe it or not, this is approved as a WRB. This is a vapor open material. Uh, and so you could actually, in a northern climate, dry through this if your house needed to do some drying through here. And you could tape the seams on this. I'm going to show you this in a minute. So that that could be the face of your WRB. And in some other climate zones that I think are a little drier, you could even omit the solid sheathing and just use that as the facer and the insulation all in one. I'm going to show you photos of both of those. But here's a couple factors you want to consider. Rain exposure zone is a big factor in deciding how to install that exterior insulation. The overhangs and architecture on the house is a big factor, meaning if I'm in a rainy climate and I have a high exposure architecture, uh, you know, a lot of parapet walls, not a lot of overhangs, I'm going to have to take a higher level of precaution on that house. And also budget's a big factor too. We're going to show you how you could actually omit sheathing and save some money. But let's first look at where you are in the map. You gotta, you gotta go, okay, where am I building my house? What's the hydrothermal region that I'm building in? This sounds kind of nerdy. I actually stole this from Building Science Corporation. But if I'm in a really cold climate, I'm gonna want more exterior insulation. If I'm in a warmer climate, I may not need as much, but trust me, in Austin, Texas, even when it's 105 out, that exterior insulation is a huge benefit to my house, keeping all those BTUs away and keeping me nice and chill on the inside of the house. And then I mentioned earlier the rain exposure zones. If you're in LA, if you're in Arizona, some of these other zones that get very little rain, 20 inches uh, or less annually, that's considered low exposure on rain. You can, get a you can get away with a lot there because it's not raining very much. On the other hand, Austin, Texas, where I am, we're actually considered moderate. We get like 35 to 40 inches annually of rainfall. So uh, I'm not a dry climate. I'm actually a pretty wet climate. If you're in uh, the Pacific Northwest, the marine climate, you know, Seattle, Portland, all those areas, you're in an extreme climate and you need to take extreme measures. So let's think about that as we're installing this WRB first method. The very first time I saw this Halo Xterra product uh, was with this builder, 2019. Stu, the owner of Blackfish Homes, actually building his own house. Let's cut to that footage and let's see how Stu's doing that install. Now, on the garage jam, what is this detail I'm seeing here? Because it looks like you've got a buck, uh, and maybe that same buck on the exterior window. So this is this is going on first, I'm assuming, over top of your shear wall. Yep. And then what's going on with this? Actually, technically, we have the Wiglow tape underneath taping the seams you with do? the plywood, okay. sealing it all up, and then badge vest on top. Okay. And then this buck is basically to bring the windows and doors out so they're flush with the insulation. Ah, uh, gotcha. And so how much insulation is going on the outside here? Inch and a half on the outside. Okay. Yeah. So our six, our seven? Our seven and a half. Okay. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Okay, so Stu used the method WRB first, tape the sheathing behind that, and then put the exterior insulation on. And here's a house that I did with pretty much the exact same method. And, and if I could kind of rewind time, this is what Stu's house would have looked like before I got there for that video. Solid sheathing on the outside. This happens to be OSB uh, with a marine grade plywood in the bottom two feet of the house. And then we use some tape. This happens to be Sega tape. There's others that would work as well for air tightness between the seams of the exterior sheathing, uh, plywood in this case, and OSB. I don't do this method anymore, which is a 12 inch strip of peel and stick uh, over the foundation and on top of the framing. There's some other methods I like better with fluid applied and tapes, but this would still work today, obviously. Uh, just, I feel like there are some better methods. And then we continue to, to tape the entire rest of the sheathing. Unfortunately, I, I didn't get a photo on the left-hand side when that got complete. But if you can picture in your mind, all the sheathing seams are taped here. And then we added a traditional house wrap on top of this. Now this happens to be the crinkly house wrap, so I do like those a lot. And then we added that exterior insulation. And here's a photo of that uh, on another house that has Halo Xterra. And you can see by the front door, uh, the house wrap is still showing and the rest of the house has that Halo Xterra on top of that. This is a great way to go. Get that WRB on first, let the WRB do the job of the water and the air proofing, and then add it. Now you don't necessarily have to use house wrap and if you've watched my videos, you know that uh, I actually kind of feel like house wraps old tech. Newer technology like 
Huber Zip system is a great way to go. I also like peeling sticks and fluid applied. They're just a little bit more bomber when it comes to water and air sealing and doing it all in one step. Here's a photo of my house under construction. And by the way, if you're wondering where of my overhangs, I thought Matt liked overhangs, check out my other videos. If you, uh, if you type into my channel, Monopoly framing, you'll see the videos on how I made an overhang on this house. But for this purpose, we've got zip system sheathing that's running continuous on the outside of my house. It's taped. I use some liquid flash. I've got a really bomber water and air barrier. And then I added the exterior insulation. Now this is a little down the process where I added my overhang. So again, go check that out. But what you're seeing here is two inches of poly ISO, foil face poly ISO. And then I added one by four rain screen battens before I installed my siding. Now this wasn't Halo Xterra, but I absolutely could have used Halo Xterra on the outside as well. They make this by the way in half inch, uh, one inch, I believe they make an inch and a half and a two inch, a big fat two inch version as well. So I have two inches on my Texas house. That's a great way to go and I'd highly recommend that. Now, when it comes to taping the seams on the face of the insulation, that's optional when the WRB is behind. On this image, you're seeing that they taped it with kind of a foil face tape. There's actually quite a few tape options out there, but if the WRB is behind, you don't necessarily have to do that. That's a bit optional. But you're going to see later, if we're going to use the face of that insulation as our WOB, then we need to tape it. We need to make sure that no water is getting behind that. Let's talk about the face around this, though, before we move on. It's probably going to be a little tell, hard to tell in the studio here, but this image shows you there's actually some perforations on the face of this uh, facer, the face of the facer. And what's happening here is the insulation itself, this GPS foam, graphite polystyrene, is vapor open. It's not a vapor barrier. Vapor can travel through it. And so they've perforated the face as well so that vapor can transfer through that facer. When we tape those seams, it's going to be watertight but vapor open. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, by the way. You notice that this is kind of gray in color. This is GPS foam, graphite polystyrene. You've seen other foams that are white that kind of look like this. That's different. That's EPS foam. This GPS foam has a couple big benefits. Number one, it has a higher R value, about, if I remember correctly from the website, 18% higher R value than EPS foam. And because the graphite is embedded in between those beads as well, it actually has a better long-term thermal resistance. It's not going to drift or change its R value. They have a warranty that says, actually, this R value is going to stay consistent over time. A couple other things I like about it while we're, while we're uh, switching gears to talk about it real quick. They don't use a lot of water in the process, so it's a pretty clean process to manufacture this. And by the way, it has a very low global warming potential compared to other types of foam on the marketplace. So you can feel good about using this on your jobs. But let's switch gears and talk now about another type of install, which is using the face of the Halo Xterra as your WRB. In other words, you're gonna install this right over some solid sheathing but this face here is going to be your water barrier, your weather resistive barrier. And that's what these images are showing you here where they've taped it. Uh, there's two different tapes that you're seeing in these uh, photos. You're seeing some red tape on that last one. You're seeing a kind of foil face tape here, but here's a full list. In fact, there's a ton of options available for taping. And oh, by the way, this is a good point to tell you. Let me uh, pull out of my PowerPoint here. Check this out. If you have not been to their website, Highly recommend you go there. They have an install manual here that I downloaded when I was preparing for this. I was blown away. This is almost 50 pages long. Some of the best graphics, some of the best information I've ever seen by far from any manufacturer. This is a really fantastic installation guide with just some really great details. So I'd highly recommend you download this from their website, which is buildwithhalo.com. Okay, so back to the presentation and finishing up here. Uh, what you're seeing here is just more images of using that WRB as the face. Uh, and then you're going to also notice that some of these builders, like this guy in particular, uh, also doing a really good job of putting a ventilation strip on the outside, a rain screen on both the walls and the roof. Best practice. Absolutely love it. I'm not sure which builder this was, but uh, big kudos to those guys uh, for doing a fantastic build. Really, really good stuff. Okay, the last install that I want to mention here is this one. 
This is going to be your least cost method of, of getting that exterior insulation. And what you're seeing here is this is in the inside looking towards the outside. And they've got Halo Xterra on the outside. But see that, that flash of metal on a diagonal here? Uh, let me point that out to you in case you're uh, wondering what I'm talking about. That flash of metal you're seeing right here, that's called lead embracing. Simpson makes it. I'm sure there's probably some other manufacturers that MyTech makes one as well. And all the framer has to do is kerf the back of that wall and let that in. That's why they call it a lead embracing. They're actually putting it in. It's kind of T-shaped. And then there's a specific nailing pattern. And what that's going to do is it's going to add structural rigidity to that wall without having to go to structural sheathing. Maybe not as big a deal today as we publish this video. Lumber prices have come back down. A year ago at this point when I'm making this video, we saw some sheathing prices, you know, standard 4 by 8 OSB 7 16 upwards of 50 plus dollars a sheet, zip system sheathing at like 60 or 70. That was a time that a lot of builders decided to go to lead embracing. There are other methods besides this metal one here as well. Uh, you could use a one by four, but you're gonna need to talk to your engineer about your shear values, your loads, where your house is, all those things. But that's definitely an option for you. And I would say that this is an option if you're in a climate zone that's getting 20 inches of less or rain, uh, where you don't have giants amount of rain, like if you're building a house in LA or Arizona or those climates that are getting 20 inches or less, this is a terrific option. You'll also notice the architecture on this house lended itself really well to this. If you look at this image right here, what are you seeing right here? Above the top plate, there's all that light coming in. You can tell this house, number one, is a one-story house, and number two has a big overhang. It looks, looks to me like that's at least a two-foot overhang on the outside of the house. That's a perfect candidate. If I'm building a one-story ranch house with a two-foot hip roof, uh, or pardon me, a two-foot overhang with a hip roof, that means I got a giant umbrella over the house. So even if I had a higher amount of rain, these walls are never gonna get wet. Put some gutters on there, and now even the base of this wall, never gonna see any water. And that's what we wanna see. We also wanna make sure that our foundation uh, is at least eight inches above grade, so that now we've, we've given those walls everything they need to stay dry. If you do that, you could even go to this same method, I would say, in climate zones that are considered moderate, 20 to 40 inches of rain a year. One thing I didn't mention earlier is in some of the images, you're gonna see some halo exterior with the white facer, like this big, big one I have here. Other times you're gonna see it with a silver facer. That's gonna change depending on where you are. If you're in the States, you're gonna typically see the white one sold. If you're in Canada, you're gonna typically see the kind of silver face sold but that's gonna vary by region. Same product, same thicknesses, same R values, just a slightly different facer. Also forgot to mention, Halo makes a bunch of other rigid foam insulations as well. So this video was about Xterra, which is obviously their exterior insulation. They also make Interra, which you guessed it, that's the inside insulation. Uh, I've seen this a lot used for basement insulation on the inside walls. And then they make sub terra, which is for outside of the foundation. So this is a below grade type of insulation to be used outside the foundation. What else? I think that's it on my, uh, on my presentation, guys. I really appreciate you guys hanging in there for a long one today. And big thanks to Halo for sponsoring. This was a really fun video for me to get together and get all this out there. All right, let me leave you with this, guys. Remember, when you're talking to your clients, I'm talking builder builder here. When you're talking to your clients about uh, exterior insulation. Remember those three tips that I gave you. Codes are changing. We're very likely going to have to do this soon. There's a building science reason to do it. We want those walls to be durable and dry and warming the sheathings. Going to go a long ways to making sure this is a healthy house that's not going to have problems. And number three, future proofing. That's a really big deal. I've seen a lot of builders in Canada in particular moving up to that 2030 code already because once they present that to the buyer and say, here's the option, People are absolutely on board with that. And lastly, I would tell you at my house in Texas, where it's unusual to see two inches of exterior insulation, I had a super comfortable house, even though it was 105 on an average July day. We had like 100 days of over 100 degrees. And at night, it cools down to a balmy 82 or 84. So it's not like we get any break even at 4 a.m. That exterior insulation does its duty both in winter and summer. It's gonna keep your occupants comfortable. It's gonna make your house more durable and ultimately you're gonna future-proof that house because before long, this is gonna be code everywhere in North America. Big thanks to Halo for sponsoring. I'll put some links to those guys in the description below, but if you're not currently a subscriber, guys, hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content here every Tuesday and every Friday. I forgot one thing. I wanted to tell you, 
about our BS 101 series. Dang it, I knew there was something I forgot. If you guys haven't seen it on our website, buildshownetwork.com, we have a series of videos that Steve Basic and I did in front of these desks, actually, giving you the basics of building science. You can even earn a certificate of completion if you answer the questions after each one of these modules. So go check that out on Build Show Network. I'll put a link in the description below so you can further your building science knowledge. That being said, follow us on TikTok or Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show. <laughs>